A very good afternoon to all of you and welcome on our sunset safari where we are starting off with one of the most beautiful images that the African bush has to offer. A pride of lions in the glorious yellow grass. Oh, good timing, girl. In the golden sunlight. It really is quite a beautiful way to start. And a very special warm welcome to the school joining us this afternoon. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Craig is on camera with me. And we are coming to you live from a place called Juma Private Game Reserve, which is in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. So kids, I hope you're all super excited to be on a safari. Remember, what you're seeing is happening right here in real life here in South Africa. So send through any questions that you'd like to ask us. And for all of our regular viewers, hashtag Safari Live is the way that you can get hold of us. Questions or comments? Now this is a pride of lions known as the Nkuhuma Pride. And from doing a quick head count, it looks as though we've got 10 lions here, four adult lionesses, and then the rest of them, believe it or not, are still relatively young cubs. And what's amazing about that is just how much they've grown. I haven't seen them in a while. And these cubs have got so big, oh, big stretch. And this is what lions like to do at this time of day. Have a lazy afternoon before it's time for them to get up and go hunting. And just by the way, the school joining us this afternoon is Frank W. Cox, and it's actually a high school. So wonderful to have all of you with us. It is fantastic. So the Inkohuma Pride have been absent from Juma for a fair amount of time. So it's nice to see them back once again. And we're, it's our dry season here in South Africa. So that basically means that the prey, the movements of the prey that they're going to be hunting has started to shift. And we're seeing more and more buffalo come back to this area, which means, hopefully, the Inkohumas are back and here to stay. And since our lions don't seem to be too keen on hunting just yet, let's go across to Tristan so he can say hello and show you something that they might like to eat. I must say a big thank you to James because this afternoon technically I'm meant to be on bushwalk. But since this is potentially my last opportunity to spend some time with the Inkahumas for a while, he very kindly offered to walk for me and let me go out on drive just so that I could spend a bit more time with them. We don't know where they're going to be tomorrow. And and tomorrow will be my last drive on Juma for a little bit before heading off to the Mara. So I really, really wanted to catch up with the Inkahumas one more time. Because when I next see these cubs, they're going to be absolutely massive. Including our little boy at the back. I can't believe how much he's grown. He's getting a little furry face now as well. The mane just starting to peak. Look there, he's got a little mohawk down his shoulders. A little patch of fur around his cheeks. Oh, of course he got shy because I drew attention to it like a teenage boy. Our driving up to leopards, welcome to our sunset safari. You want to know if I can see amber eyes? I can't see any of the lion's eyes, unfortunately, which does make it quite tricky. I, from what I understand, she was missing, correct me if I'm wrong, but she was missing from the sunrise safari this morning. And she's been missing from the pride now for a little while. We think there's a possibility of cubs on the way. I don't know. I haven't seen her, so I can't really, I can only go off what other people have been saying to me. Um, I haven't seen any sign of her. I think she's around here somewhere. I'm sure that, I know they had all five of them all together not so long ago. I haven't seen amber eyes. There's a couple of the cubs. There's at least one cub that's inherited that amber-eyed gene. But no, I'm not sure if she's here or not. The only lioness I've identified as one of the mothers, one of the young mothers with the spotty nose. She's the one that got up and walked off and lay down separate from the rest of the pride over there in front of us. Uh, that's the spotty-nosed lioness. But I, I'll have to, we'll have to wait until this evening when they start to get up. And with this chilly weather, the chances are they might get moving earlier than normal. There she is. So that's for the, one of the mothers, if I remember correctly, she's the mother of the oldest set of cubs, if I'm not mistaken. 
It's been so long, I've, I have to try and remind myself of who's who in the Inkahuma Pride. I think the last time I saw them was with Senzor. Now, Mary, you want to know how can we tell one pride from another? Well, the big thing is the area that they move around in um, and in the dynamics as well. So knowing the fact that there are typically five adult lionesses in the Nkuhuma pride, they spend a lot of time around this area. This is their, within their territory, absolutely within their territory. And there's also a very distinctive genetic look, I find, to the lion prides. Look, in isolation, I don't think I would be able to look at one picture and instantly say, oh, that's an Inkahuma and that's a Styx. But you start to kind of get familiar with their facial features a little bit. There's just certain ways, like the Inkahumas are quite, um, I wouldn't call them lanky lions. They're quite sort of slender looking lions, whereas the Styx are quite stocky looking. And of course, the fact that the Styx have had really serious mange in the past. The Nkuma's got it as well, but the sticks have been far worse affected. So the lionesses are slightly scruffier looking. But really it's based on area as well. And the fact that we, as guides, are always sort of partially, as much as we can, keeping track of where the lion prides are through WhatsApp communication. We've all got a big group that we communicate on whenever we see lion prides. So we know that they've been in this area for a while. What's going to be interesting is getting to know the different lion prides in Kenya because we're going to be seeing far more prides. But we'll have to develop the same history that we have with the Inkahumas. I mean, many of you have been watching them for years and years. I've spent the last two years of my life pretty much with the Inkahumas. A little bit with the sticks, sometimes with the Salalas. But essentially the Inkahumas have been the lions that I've seen. And Kumas and the Birmingham boys. And we went through that whole pride takeover, watched their numbers dip. And charming, there are five lionesses in the Nkuhuma pride. Um, an, older, an older lioness, two younger lionesses around about the same age. Those are the three that are the mothers of the six cubs. And then amber eyes and then one young lioness who I presume is here. She might be the missing one. I honestly don't know. And the younger lioness was... The younger lioness was still... She was, what, she was about a year and a half or so when the Birmingham boys first took over two years ago and we watched, we found out that they'd killed her sister and it was quite a, a tough situation that the Nkormas went through because when I first arrived here, there were eight of them. And just before I arrived here, there were nine. And the Birmingham boys killed two adult lionesses, one young lioness, and then, of course, Junior moved out on his own. Junior was the male from the Inkahuma Pride, and it was time for him to move off on his own. So to see them flourishing once again, although Tristan's been telling me about their history and the fact that the Pride actually used to be enormous once upon a time, so it's nice to see them gaining in strength once again. Lots of hungry mouths to feed, though. And I would say that means that tonight they're going to be out and hunting. And this is exactly where we want to be. We want to be sitting right here in time for them to get up and start moving. I really want the little boy to lift up his face again. He had his head up when we first arrived. I couldn't believe the scraggly mane he's got. I always have a soft spot for young male lions. There's something about their awkward gangliness that I find very endearing. And their scruffy manes. I wonder how big they'll be when I get back. They, of course, are completely unconcerned by my departure. Right, they're unconcerned about quite a lot of things this afternoon when they've got a nice sleepy spot in the shade. So let's head back across to James, who apparently has got some spiky things. They definitely look as though they should be in pyjamas. There's our little boy 
with his head up and his scraggly mane around his cheeks and his chest. It's very cool. I imagine that he's going to have a much fuller mane when I next see him. He's got amberish eyes. <laughs> of course he shut them on demand. I was just wondering about the bonds between siblings because of course he's going to go off at some point in the next two or so years, maybe even two and a half years. When he reaches sexual maturity, it will be time for him to leave the rest of the pride. I was just wondering whether the sisters or females ever miss the males or if they look for them in the beginning. Especially for siblings, because these cubs grow up so incredibly close to each other. They're constantly cuddling on top of each other, playing with each other, chasing each other around. It makes me wonder about the bonds between them. I guess they're severed instinctively, just like they must be for leopard siblings. And I think what we shall do this afternoon is we'll probably leave our sleepy lions and then come back a little bit later. Oh, they don't look like they're up to too much. Which is fine. That's what lions do. Often sleeping for 20, 22 hours a day sometimes. I can't work out which lioness this is, though. And hello to Olivia, who is seven years old. Olivia, I have seen white lions before, and I think they are amazing creatures. So a white lion is just like these lions, and you can actually find them in this particular reserve, in this particular protected area. We don't see them as yet, but we don't see them here, but there's a family or a pride of lions up further to the north of us that has that white lion gene. White lions are not albino lions, they're leucistic lions. So they still have a certain degree of pigment. It does create that very startling pale coat, and it's, it's just a recessive gene. So it's rare, in nature, and you have to obviously get two parents carrying that recessive gene, but it does pop up every now and again in unexpected places. So the most famous white lions are in the Timbavati, which is a reserve that is open to this reserve and open to the Kruger. And then all of a sudden a white lion popped up, up near the Lobombo Mountains in the Kruger, which is all the way on the opposite side of the reserve. So the genetics are there. Um, they're not common, though, because naturally a white animal out here isn't a particularly good color. It makes their skin more sensitive to the sun. It had, comes or carries a certain disadvantage when it comes to camouflage and hunting. So it's not a gene that has been selected for, which is why there's lots of arguments about places that breed white lions on the basis of trying to save them or argue for keeping them protected as a separate species. It's not really necessary because it's something that nature takes care of. It's just a color mutation. That's all it is. It's a color morph. Just like you get some melanistic leopards in nature or a king cheetah. They're not separate species. Of course, lions aren't too bothered by the differences they see in their pale-colored brethren. Laurie, you want to know if lions are colorblind? Pretty much. They certainly don't see in the same amount of color that we do. Uh, there are certain colors that stand out to them a little bit, so they're not completely, they're not seeing in complete grayscale. They do see a little bit, if I remember correctly, they see a little bit of red and a little bit of green. So they can see a little bit of color, but it is not particularly good. Obviously, that color vision has been sacrificed for the ability to see at night. So they've got a completely different concentration of rod and cone cells, or dis uh, not distribution, balance of rod and cone cells in their eyes which allows them to see pretty much as well as we do during the day, but at night. 
making use of all kinds of ambient light, anything that's around. So they do see a little bit of colour. I think it's blue as well. I think they also see quite a bit of blue, if I'm not mistaken. So they're not... Everybody always talks about predators being completely colorblind. So they're not. They don't see completely in black and white. Obviously, blacks and whites, as colors, do stand out very, very clearly. And there's the lioness with the fluffy chin. And that's the other mother. Okay, I figured, <laughs> figured, figured out at least which two lionesses are here. I still don't know if it's the younger lioness or amber eyes. There we go. That's the lioness with the fluffy chin. We develop strange ways of identifying our, our lionesses or recognizing them. The animals that do have very good color vision are birds and primates. And that does explain the use of bright colors in the various primate spe species when it comes to reproduction, when it comes to sort of marking off exactly. Oh, are we going to make it? Almost. Yay. Well done, Craig. There we go. Oh, no. No, <laughs> they're just too much above us. There's a pair of starlings sitting in the dead tree above us, which would have been very appropriate for our color vision chat. Birds, of course, known for a lot of bird species having very bright colored feathers and bright colored bills and faces, clearly demonstrates that they can see quite well in color, even without having to study their eyes. And then primates, as I said, use of different bright colors in terms of their reproductive strategy. The blue, the, the blue monkey, the vervet monkey. I don't think I need to explain to you why uh, in my head I call them a blue monkey. <laughs> Flies are biting them. Okay, lion puddle. I think it's time for us to leave you for now and come back a bit later. We'll go off in search of other things and then come back to the lions a bit later. And then we can sit with them for the last hour or so of drive. All right, I wonder what on earth Tristan has planned for his afternoon. Perhaps he'll tell you. I'm doing wonderfully. I'm back with our lions and we've timed it perfectly as they are just waking up, feeling playful and full of life. <laughs> and apparently enjoying chewing on a stick. I'm just waiting. We are going to move into a better position in a moment. I'm just waiting for two vehicles to move out, and then we can make our way in. The bush is full of toys, if you know where to look. If your siblings aren't feeling particularly playful. Sorry, hold on, everybody. I'm just going to wait for this vehicle to move hold on okay we're gonna we're gonna zip in there oh butt's out thanks guys one of our viewers on the back of one of the lodge vehicles oh goodness these lines are up and moving And the good news is they're moving back further into Juma. Doesn't look as though they're going to go into Simbambili, which was my big worry. We're right close to the boundary. Hi guys, thank you. Thanks very much. Here we go. Awesome. Perfect. Look at this. <laughs> I see that. Thank you. Look over there, Craig. They're climbing up into the fallen tree. Oh, oh apparently, as I said, that had changed its mind. These cubs have been so playful recently. Jumping up and down in trees. Tristan said he had an amazing morning with them not so long ago.
Tad B, welcome to the Sunset Safari with our incredible Uncle Homers. You want to know what their name means? Their name is the local language name for a tree known as the brown ivory tree. And it's a type of tree that at some point we will show you on our live safari drive. There aren't any near me at the moment, or otherwise I would show you. It's quite an uncommon it's quite an uncommon tree. We don't see that many of them in this particular area. But the Inkahuma tree, or a brown ivory tree, that's where the pride gets its name. So a lot of the prides here are named for the areas that they found in, or are originally from. But our lions are getting up. <laughs> Tristan's leopard is already up and on the move are indeed getting up and playing but I am doing exactly what Tristan was doing which is getting all the vehicles sorted and into position but we seem to be on top of things for now <laughs> these cubs it's so special because the last few times the sort of the times that I spent with the Inkohumas the cubs were they they were fully recovered from their white muscle disease and that, this is quite a long story but we'll, I'll try and keep it as short as possible. Suffice to say during the drought the cubs were not well at all and two of them actually didn't make it. <laughs> oh, you're going to get into trouble. <laughs> and six of the cubs did survive but for a long time they were very mangy and not very healthy at all and when we did see them they weren't playful. They were skittish and hiding in thickets and they just weren't themselves which is why I'm so happy <laughs> to see them playing like this it's really lovely really really special Mary, you want to know, while we watch our cubs playing in trees, you want to know in a pride who leads the hunting. Um, you'll find that all of the lionesses will take initiative. Um, often, the older female will be the one with the most experience and she'll know how to go about the whole thing and the whole process. But I've noticed particularly when you get young females of just reaching adult age, they often initiate the hunt. But there's no set leader. There's no set line that takes responsibility each and every single time. These lions work so well as a team. They don't need a leader. They just know what's expected of them. It's phenomenal to watch. Everybody just seems to know where to go. And that, of course, comes from hours of play like this, getting to know each other so well that they can predict their every move. Now, often what you'll find is that these cubs at this age, they want to help. They really, really want to help. Their instincts tell them to help with the hunt, but as a result, they tend to mess it up. The lionesses are trying to stalk something, and the cubs just have no technique or tact, and they come bumbling straight in, and they upset the apple cart. I've seen it so many more times than I can count. Now, that does frequently happen. Our lions have settled for now. They're going to be looking for their dinner shortly, which is something that a tundi doesn't have to do. They are wide awake, and one of the cubs has just sidled right past me. There it is, coming across to the right of us. They are most definitely waking up and showing all kinds of signs that they're going to be on the hunt shortly. If only I could convey to them that there's an entire herd of wildebeest on quarantine right outside our camp. It would be wonderful. And one of the lionesses is feeling a little bit lazy. Not all of them have got up yet. And they've scattered themselves. It's quite a tricky area, so we'll just have to wait for them to keep moving into view. Jinlin? No, there's no real ranking within the cubs within the, the, the sort of the various sets of cubs the older ones will be stronger and inevitably that means that at the dinner table as you know all lions fight for their own place even the cubs so at the dinner table the older cubs will have slightly more success and they'll tend to be more dominant and if you've got a male which we do in this particular group of cubs there's six cubs here one of them is a male if you have a male 
um, he will be bigger. By around about six months of age, you're going to start to see the difference in size between the male and the female cubs of the same age. So he will be bigger, and he will start to become sort of more and more dominant at dinner time. But there's no real hierarchy. It's just age and size based. And that will even out once the cubs have grown up, when they become a proper, full, fully fledged members of their pride. The stillness, the calm before the coming storm. I love this time of day because there's always that sense of expectation. And it seems like just yesterday when Dave and I were sitting with the Inkahumas in infrared and these cubs were so tiny. James was in the Mara the first time. So it must have been, when was that, October last year? Sometime around there. The cubs were minuscule and it was the first time we'd started playing with the infrared technology. I was sitting in the dark, surrounded by Inkahumas, listening to them roar. I hope they roar tonight. They've been very silent recently. Is there a lion behind that tree? There appears to be. They're all scattered all around us. They've just gone still again. There's a female at the back there. Here we go. Now, Nikesha, you want to know if lions share their territory with leopards. Yes, they do. The territories do overlap. It's not that they're sharing, really. The definition is of a territory is basically within between animals of the same species. So the lions have their territories. The lion pride is their territory. They'll defend it against other lion prides. And within that lion pride territory, they'll also it will also encompass several territories of leopards. Now, the thing is, when lions kill leopards, which does occasionally happen, or when a leopard kills a lion cub, which also occasionally happens, in a situation like that, I'm just showing the vehicle where the lions are. In a situation like that, it's not for territorial reasons, it's for competition reasons, which are subtly different. So all predators will kill another predator if they have the opportunity to do so. Particularly, of course, when they're young, because then they're more vulnerable. Here comes another cub stalking through, who also active a moment ago. What's happening? Thinking about pouncing on that lioness, and maybe thinking twice about it. Another big yawn. And usually when our big cats yawn like that, when they start to lick themselves, lick their paws, it's a precursor to stepping up and moving off. Speaking of the cubs and the hunting, Kat, you want to know if the lion cubs are hunting with the adults now. As we said earlier, they are. They're going with on the hunt, but they're not particularly useful. We've seen Taylor had that incredible sighting with the Inkahumas and the young buffalo and the cubs practicing their hunting technique on that poor young buffalo, jumping on its back, trying to learn all about the, the sort of the mechanics of catching something like a... Thanks, Megs. <laughs> Wrong radio. I was giving her a confused face because she was just telling me what I was saying. It's nice to hear it twice, though. Um, what do we about cubs? Yes, so cubs, at the moment, they will be participating, but not particularly well. So they might actually, more than anything else, get in the way. But that's all part and parcel of the learning process, and lionesses have to teach them. Well, they learn from watching the way that the lionesses hunt. 
And after that, instinct takes over. But it was interesting. I was working years ago with a woman doing her PhD research into lion behavior. And of we were sitting, we spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours with the same pride every single day, day after day. And of the hunts that we saw, almost all of them were initiated by the youngest female who had just, just reached around about three years old, so sexual maturity stage. And she was the one that just kept pushing, pushing for the hunt. And I think that instinct is there and they're still practicing and developing their techniques. And they haven't yet perhaps developed the knowledge as to when not to even bother. I think the older lionesses know exactly when to stop. All right, I'm going to switch on the lights now. The reason I'm going to do that is there are other vehicles in the sighting, and I think they will feel like they have to keep their lights off, lights off because because of us. <laughs> I am going to I'm going to switch on the lights so that they can see as well. The cubs are old enough now that it's not a concern. Tesla, who is six years old. Tesla, you wanted to know how I learned to be so brave with lions. You know what, Tesla? I don't think I'm brave at all. I know that these lions aren't going to see me as something that they want to eat or that they want to attack. But I was very lucky, Tesla. Very, very lucky. Because when I grew up, my parents really loved the wild as well, and my grandfather also did. So I spent a lot of time coming to the game reserves when I was a little girl. And I saw lions from when I was very young in the, the Kruger National Park and in other places. So I was lucky. I think I learned then that I didn't need to be scared of the lions. So I'm not being brave. I just know that they're very, very unlikely to hurt me. But being brave doesn't mean being silly. So we always have to exercise common sense out here. And what I mean by that is... I know these lions won't hurt me in the car, but I also know that if I go walking around at night, they could hurt me. And that's why you have to be responsible, and we never go walking around in the bush at night. This is beautiful. Biggest threat, hands down. Oh, here comes the shin. Oh. <laughs> Farm dog, you want to know what is the biggest threat to the lion cub's survival? Absolutely, hands down at this point, it will be a coalition takeover. That seems to be very, very unlikely at the moment. Um, the Birmingham boys have established themselves particularly well in this area. There's no real threat that is going to come their way anytime soon from any of the... Oh, she's Fleming grimacing at the back there. She obviously smelt something interesting. That's that snarling face that she seems to be pulling. She's not. She wasn't snarling. It's to draw the scent up into her mouth. So that's the biggest threat to them because at this age, they are... I lost my train of thought there for a second. These cubs are still too young for their, the mothers to mate again. So what happens in a prior, in a coalition takeover is that the male lions come in and they kill each and every single cub that isn't theirs to bring the females back into estrus and to mate with them once again. Uh, she stopped behind a tree. Okay. Alrighty then. Where's that lioness? Oh, she's moved to... Here she comes. Quick head rub and on her way. Go, go east, go east, go east. Come on, girl, go east. No, that's west. Go east. <laughs> and coalition takeovers are really sad. It's a sad moment for the lion prides because they lose their cubs. They sometimes lose the females that try to defend their cubs because male lions, when they do take over a territory, are pumped full of testosterone and there are casualties of war, so to speak. 
So if females do protect their cubs, they run the risk of inciting the ire of the males and actually getting killed themselves. And there's a situation playing out at the moment with the Salati, or what was the Salati males, it's now the Salati male. Um, the one Salati male died not so long ago, and he leaves behind a coalition member, and then the pride of lions, the Talamatis, and the Talamatis have cubs with them, sorry, I'm just checking something. Talamatis have cubs with them at the moment that have been fathered by the Salatis, but now they're severely weakened because there's only one Salati left. So all of the guides recently we've been talking about, hopefully he manages to hang on for long enough for those cubs to get to the age where they're safe from being killed by other males. Because apparently the Birmingham boy is pushing further and further north at times towards Manuleti. The cubs still, no, they still don't have a proper roar yet. Um, their voices haven't fully developed. Their bodies haven't fully developed. I think you'd be surprised at how deep their roar would be now, but it still won't be a proper adult roar. And we've seen them growling at a kill, so already we know that they've got serious voices on them, but they're not quite ready yet to start roaring properly. It was so sweet when we watched them roar that time, and they were all going... Tiny little voices in the dark, trying to match the adults. Oh, girl. Turn left, turn left. Oh, why are you all going west? Don't do that. Okay. <laughs> Cubs rolling on top of each other. Okay. We're going to have to do some shifting around here and it's going to be a bit tricky. We're going to have to play leapfrog with the vehicles. So while we do that, let's go back to Tristan who's made his way all the way back onto Juma. Of our sunset safari, we are with the incredible Inkahumas. Probably the only time I'm allowed to use the adjective incredible. And after their earlier playfulness, they've settled down a bit of grooming and also affection between the cubs and the females. Now, who knows where they're going to end up tomorrow. Hopefully for the sunrise safari they will make their way further onto Juma and hopefully they will have managed to catch something. So I'm just going to do the quick goodbyes and thank yous because no one really wants to look at my face when you've got lions. I will see you all tomorrow morning on the sunrise safari but a big thank you to Craig. Let's, let's watch the lions. They're much nicer than me. Especially since we've only got 30 seconds left. Big thank you to Craig for his wonderful camera work and a thank you to Megs. Megs, who's your D2? this afternoon. Oh, Chantelle, of course. I spoke to her twice today. I'm talking nonsense. Chantelle in D2, sending through your questions and your comments. Most importantly, thank you to all of you. Thank you for joining me on my last drive for now on Juma. For tomorrow, I shall be on foot. Hopefully, the Inkohumas will be around tomorrow morning. Join us on the Sunrise Safari to find out.